Welcome to our webinar, Ladoute Dam, The Power of Faith-Based Investor Voice and the Rise of Conflict. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Tracy Cadet, and I am a program coordinator at Investor Advocates for Social Justice. I'm excited to welcome you all here today. We are joined by fabulous guest speakers who have been leaders in peace movements and calls for corporate accountability. Again, welcome to everyone joining. Our webinar will consist of 45 minutes of presentations with a 15 minute Q&A session at the end. But please feel free to drop your questions in the chat as we go along or use the raise hand uh, button during the Q&A session. This webinar will be recorded and you will be sent the slides in the recording following our event. To briefly introduce Investor Advocates for Social Justice, we are a nonprofit organization representing faith-based institutional investors working to leverage investments to advance human rights, climate justice, racial equity, and the common good. IESJ and its affiliates have been engaging defense contractors for many years to encourage better management of critical human rights concerns. So before we jump into our presentations, uh, I wanted to start this webinar with a land acknowledgement, which is a formal statement that recognizes the land on which we are living and working, respecting indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards. I am calling into you from Lenape land, and we are putting a link into the chat if you want to learn more about land acknowledgements or where you are calling in from. This is especially critical as we talk about militarization and nuclear weapons, acknowledging the leadership of Black, Indigenous, and people of color and peace movements and the disp disparate impacts these communities are burdened with. I'm going to kick it kick this event off with a reflection from our executive director here at ISJ. I would like to introduce you to Courtney Wicks. Hi, good morning. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna kick things off. Pope Francis in his teachings speaks of the audacity of peace, a concept that challenges us to dare greet greatly to embrace the unconventional path towards healing, accountability, and shared responsibility. This audacity beckons the holders of power, the architects of nation destinies, the global community, corporate actors, investors, finance professionals, and every one of us to perform acts of prophetic courage. It's a call to reimagine our approach to conflict, to realize that even in the labyrinth of geopolitical strife, the path to peace is not only achievable, but necessary for a sustainable and livable future. In La Daute Dam, Pope Francis implores us to pioneer a new paradigm, recognizing that we stand at a pivotal juncture in history. The challenges we face are unparalleled, not just in our era, but throughout human existence. Our social and human constructs have created unprecedented humanitarian crises and sets us on a collision course with ecological collapse, threatening the very essence of life on earth. The specter of war, particularly through the deployment of weapons of mass destruction and nuclear weapons casts a long shadow, not just annihilating the present, but condemning the future to a bleak, uninhabitable existence. Next slide. The data from ACLID, ACLID, the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, paints a grim picture, indicating a surge in global violence. Over the past five years, there's, there has been a 22%, with a spike to 40% increase in global conflict since 2020, of which one in six people on the planet have been impacted by conflict. The impact is staggering. 144, 141 million people were displaced in 2023, and the numbers in 2024 are not much better. This is coupled with the looming threat of climate-induced migration, which is estimated to potentially displace over a billion people by 2050, according to the United Nations Refugee Agency. The intersection of war and ecological crisis not only underscores the urgency of our actions, but our, but our different sides of the same coin. The corporate world, especially sectors like defense, oil and gas, and banking, plays a significant role in these impacts by either intentionally or in unintentionally perpetuating conflict and undermining peace efforts. The ongoing operations of numerous US-based companies in conflict zones, their indirect support for warfare through economic engagements, and the defense industry's vast political influence highlight a complex web of complicity in the machinery of war. 
Additionally, we have yet to reconcile and repair the legacy of colonialism and racism globally. This intricate dance of economics, social constructs, and conflict underscores the need for a radical rethink of our global priorities. The repercussions of conflict ripple through, through our environment and climate, reaching far beyond the immediacy of the battlefield. This, this scourge devastates ecosystems, it fractures communities, and it inflicts profound upheaval on indigenous peoples and First Nations, whose lives and ancestral lands are often caught in the crossfires of resource extraction and geopolitical strategizing. The relentless consumption of fossil fuels by military operations, the spiraling arms trade, and the rapid incorporation of artificial intelligence in warfare confront us with a deep moral and ethical quandaries. War and armed conflict bring hidden human and ecological costs that permeate the corporate frameworks involved in weapons manufacturing, <clears throat> production, testing, and the sourcing of minerals. These processes are entrenched in a systemic environmental racism and injustice alongside egregious human rights abuses human rights abuses against indigenous peoples and First Nations, spanning both domestic and international spheres. The surge in weapons transactions invariably triggers a cascade of human and environmental tolls across their entire life cycle, magnified by the voracious fossil fuel consumption inherent in this value chain. In La Daute Dam, Pope Francis urges us to recognize and untangle the complex web of interconnected issues advocating for a holistic and expansive approach to devise strategies that address these intertwined challenges by prioritizing the experiences of those most directly affected, innocent civilian survivors of crimes against humanity and war crimes, indigenous peoples and staunch human rights defenders, we widen our perspective. This inclusive approach enriched by collaboration with thought leaders and advocates at local, national, and global levels enables us to forge paths towards healing and resilience, embodying the comprehensive vision Pope Francis calls us to adopt. La Daute Dam demands a radical collaboration across disciplines and with groups united by sh shared values, weaving together social, environmental, and economic justice movements. It insists on bring, bridging divides to craft solutions that reflect our interconnected challenges and shared destiny. The push for peace building, corporate responsibility and ethical investment shifts from a plea to an imperative for change. Champions like ISJ board member, Sister Susan Francois, uh, Kathy Rowan of the Mary Knoll uh, Sisters and the relentless dedication of Sisters Nora Nash, uh, Ethel Howley, who are both now retired, Sister Barbara Ayers, Ann Schultz, and Sister Gloria Ohl from the Franciscan Sisters of Allegheny, New York, uh, New York, and of course the late Sister Pat Daly, along with the uh, along with her congregation, the Dominican Sisters of Caldwell, exemplify unwavering commitment to human rights, peace, and demilitarization. Despite limited mainstream support, their advocacy for environmental justice in vulnerable communities aligned with the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights, resolutions against militarization, militarization, militarization charts a path to a more peaceful, sustainable world. This imperative transcends the mere cessation of hostilities. It's about architecting a future where peace is the cornerstone, cornerstone of our very existence, intertwining human and ecological well being into a single unbreakable thread. This work, perhaps the most critical in the annals of human history, is in incomplete without peace. There's no peace without freedom, no freedom without justice, and no planet without all three. We stand at a pivotal junction, juncture. Our actions today will most definitely dictate our future tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you for that powerful reflection, Courtney. A uh, perfect way to start off this webinar. Um, I wanted to introduce our first speaker, Sister Susan Jordan, Jordan, sorry, from the School Sisters of Notre Dame. She coordinated the Midwest Coalition for Responsible Investment St. Louis from 1991 to 2000. 2007 and served as a social responsibility resource person for a group in the School Sisters of Notre Dame during much of that time. She has served as provincial counselor for the former School Sisters of Notre Dame St. Louis province from 2007 to 
2011. I'm sorry, to 2011. And as provincial counselor for the Central Pacific Province from 2011 to 2019. Thank you so much for being a panelist today, Sister Susan. I'm going to hand it over to you to speak on the Faith Voice rationale. Uh, good morning. My name is Susan Jordan, a school sister of Notre Dame living in St. Louis, and I'm delighted to be part of this webinar, Laudate Deum, The Power of Faith-Based Investor Voice in the Rise of Conflict. That title expresses the world situation in which we live, the intense polarization, wars, lack of respect for the other, all extremely complex situations. It is within this state of the world that faith-based investors engage corporations with wisdom, hope, compassion, and determination. Faith-based investing is grounded in belief in the common good, in respect for the dignity of all people, in support of their human rights, and in recognition of the goodness and fragility of earth and the cosmos. This seminar emphasizes the power and stick to of the faith-based investor voice, even in the rise of conflict, to look at corporate investments through the lens of faith. As you said, in the past, I coordinated the Midwest Coalition for Responsible Investment, now part of seventh generation interfaith coalition for responsible investment. Midwest Coalition members joined the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, as well as the Tri-State Coalition, now your investor, Advocates for Social Justice, and others in shareholder activities. And I continue to be a member of my province's Corporate Responsibility Committee. When I was coordinator of the Midwest Coalition, both McDonnell Douglas, now Boeing, and General Dynamics were headquartered in St. Louis. Coalition members and others did what this seminar is about. They purchased enough stock to attend, attempt to dialogue with the companies, to submit shareholder proposals, to attend the annual meetings, and raise questions related to the consequences of the use of their products. Several shareholder proposals this year are asking companies to evaluate their human rights policies, how their activities, production, marketing, lobbying, political donations are in alignment with what their policies say, then acknowledge and report instances of misalignment and state whether and how the identified incongruencies have or will be addressed. Another proposal asks the company to examine and report the company's human rights impacts associated with high-risk products and services, including those in conflict areas and are those violating international law. These and other proposals require the companies to consider more than their bottom line, to broaden their concept of human rights to include understanding of the web of connections with the entire human family and all of creation, and to consider the effects of their daily work on the human rights of others. There are many documents represent, referencing human rights. The UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights or an authoritative framework outlining human rights responsibilities of states and businesses. In the past, church-related documents have referenced human rights being threatened and expressed the need for human rights to be applied to technology. They have noted that the global arms race diverts human creativity and resources to projects that threaten lives and livelihoods and the balance of the biosphere. More recently in Laudate Deum, a 2023 apostolic exhortation, Pope Francis cautions 
about the possible effects of human power, profit, lobbying, and political expenditures. He said, we have made impressive and awesome technological advances, and we have not realized that at the same time, we have turned into highly dangerous beings capable of threatening the lives of many beings and our own survival. Regarding human power, he said, the ethical decadence of real power is disguised thanks to marketing and false information, useful tools in the hands of those with greater resources to employ them to shape public opinion. And again, about profit, the mentality of maximum gain at minimal cost disguised in terms of reasonableness, progress, and illusory promises makes impossible any sincere concern for our common home and any real preoccupation about assisting the poor and the needy discarded by our society. It is essential that companies' evaluations consider the consequences of their activities and work, and how the concept of maximum gain at minimal cost plays out in this work. And a few comments from the words of Laudato Si, the encyclical written in 2015. We read that once certain resources have been depleted, the scene will be set for new wars, albeit under the guise of noble claims. War always does grave harm to the environment and to the cultural rights of peoples, risks which are magnified when one considers nuclear arms and biological weapons. Another section of Laudato Si recognizes that nuclear energy, biotechnology, information technology, knowledge of our DNA, and other abilities have given us knowledge and the economic resources to use them and impressive dominance of the whole of humanity and the entire world. Shareholders need to question how this dominance is evidenced in the companies being addressed. Weapons produced by these companies can be found around the world in areas where there is violence and war. Some of those weapons are acquired legally and others by illegal means. All such weapons in areas of violence are of concern. Faith-based investors need to continue to ask hard questions of the companies because we know the power and influence of their ongoing marketing, lobbying, political contributions of the revolving door phenomenon of their being headquartered in centers of power. We need to act with dogged determination and live in hope. My community's constitution says, working toward the enablement of persons and the promotion of human dignity, we contribute to positive systemic change in society. I think all faith-based investors do that. We believe that serious reevaluation of corporate engagements through the lens of faith will hasten bringing about the returns of shared integrity, shared humanity, respect for all people, all creation, and peace. May it be so. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Sister Susan. Um, thank you for your work. Thank you for that reminder um, and that amazing presentation. I would just like to remind and encourage attendees to submit your questions into the Q&A function, um, you know, now and throughout the, the presentations. Our next guest speaker is Susie Snyder. Susie is a program coordinator at the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize winning international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. She facilitates the development and execution of key programs, including the management of 
ICANN's divestment work and engagement with the financial sector. Susie also coordinates the Don't Bank on the Bomb project. She's an expert on nuclear weapons with over two decades experience working at the intersect between nuclear weapons and human rights. Susie Snyder, everyone. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great that everybody is here to join us today. You can go to the next slide. Thank you, Erin. Um, I am super excited to get to speak about this, to join you in this. Um, I think I want to start off just reminding everybody that one of the amazing things we've seen, almost a, if you can call it that, a revolution in the Catholic Church, uh, <laughs> which sounds like a shocking thing, um, <laughs> that we've seen over the last years, um, is a shift away, uh, not only condemn, a shift for, from the church, not only condemning the, the potential use of nuclear weapons, but also the, um, Pope Francis has also said that the threat of their use, as well as their very possession, is to be con condemned. And the problem of nuclear weapons is something that unfortunately still exists, um, uh, but it is a problem that can be solved. If we go to the next slide. Um, one, of the things, one of the things, just to remind everybody what we're talking about, it's only nine countries that have nuclear weapons, right? It's not everybody, it's nine countries. There's about another 40 or so countries that subscribe to a theory of nuclear deterrence, but still that's less than 50 countries in the world that believe or have some faith in this concept of nuclear weapons as a useful tool. As of today, we have nearly double that who have subscribed in either by signing or ratifying the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So we have more than twice the number of countries that have firmly rejected anything to do with these bombs than, than support them. And I think it's important to keep that in mind, um, that it's a very, it is a minority that holds on to these weapons, but they are so destructive. They are terrifying, they capture our imagination um, because of that. And so when we're thinking about what to do about these weapons, we have to be creative in our solutions. If we go to the next slide, please. There are lots of ways to deal with the problem of nuclear weapons. We have the technology to dismantle them safely and securely. We've gone from almost 80,000 of them to 12 and a half thousand. We can take them apart. It's more than love that dismantles an atomic bomb. The science is there. And one of the ways that we look to, to solve the problem of nuclear weapons is to increase the cost of nuclear weapons. And there's lots of ways to increase the costs around nuclear weapons. One is building and sharing on the research um, that's gone into the effects of nuclear weapons use, their production, their development, their testing. We know more about what these weapons do than we ever have before. And disseminating that research helps us solve the problem of the weapons. Another way is to build the law. We have a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. It went into, it, um, went into effect in 2021. Almost half the countries of the world are on board with it now. And it's building the norm against the weapons. We have legislation in countries that um, embrace that treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, but that go even further than that. We have legislation in countries that restrict financing for um, materials that contribute to weapons of mass destruction production. We have legislation in countries that, um, that helps to prohibit um, investment in other inhumane and, and other indiscriminate weapons. And we have investors who are willing to take, who are willing to um, commit acts of prophetic courage and take this issue directly to the companies that are building the weapons. Um, and all of this adds pressure to the bottom line of those companies. And I think that's one of the things that I wanna talk about a little bit more right now. If we go to the next slide, please. Because what we're doing is we're taking the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons to the private sector. And it's, and I wanted to focus on four areas in which we're doing that. RTX, formerly Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and PNC. And tell you a little bit about how each of these are connected to nuclear weapons. And then others will go on to explain how we're bringing the issue to their front door or shareholder meeting as the case may be. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. First, RTX, used to be called Raytheon. 
Everybody knows Raytheon, right? Everybody knows Raytheon is horrible. They build nasty weapons that are dropped indiscriminately on people all over the world. Raytheon weapons wind up in people's hands that should never have had access to them. Raytheon changed its name, kept the shame, still going and still, still continuing with contracts, particularly around nuclear weapons. There's three I wanted to highlight. They are responsible for building what's called an air-launched cruise missile. Now, these are massive bombs that come out of airplanes and are nuclear-armed and are targeted um, at cities because nuclear weapons are, are designed to destroy cities. These are not weapons that use on battlefields. They're weapons to intimidate and terrify civilian populations. They're weapons that are so massive that there has been a taboo in force preventing their use in anger since 1945. They're terrifying and they should be, they are. But Raytheon or RTX as it's now called, still keeps, keeps pulling in some contracts, not so many as others, but still pulling in some contracts about the air launched cruise missile. The new one is called the long range standoff weapon. They also are building the launch platform for intercontinental ballistic missiles for the US. This is both um, for the existing Minuteman system, as well as the new Sentinel system that's being developed. And RTX does the command control communication. So they help the US government and the US military figure out exactly where to target and make sure that the bomb hits the target that it's supposed to hit. Next slide, please. Now, RTX has a total of about 3% of its overall turnover connected to nuclear weapons income. It's a tiny one in the overall picture. They make a lot of other weapons. Nuclear is very small. However, Lockheed Martin does a little bit more. And Lockheed Martin make, builds nuclear weapons not just for the US, but also for the UK. The UK leases its nuclear weapon system from the US. It's a Trident system, submarine launched, launched missiles. Um, they're constantly on patrol around the earth. The submarines are old and they stay underwater for upwards. The last two UK subs came up after almost the first one after 192 days, the second one after 200 days underwater. Um, and I don't know about you, but if I were trapped in a box underwater with nuclear missiles for 200 days, I might go bunkers. Um, and I can't imagine the psychological toll it must take on these mariners, on these submarine operators. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're talking about Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin also does what's called missile payload integration. So they make sure for the U new US system that the, the nuclear part of the bomb goes bang when it needs to. And they've been the designer of the re-entry systems for the Minuteman, another inter inter intercontinental ballistic missile, Whew, that's a mouthful, um, for decades. Now that means that they build the part to make sure when this missile is launched off the coast of California is where they test them, launched off the coast of California and it, re it exits the earth's atmosphere and, that's, and then re-enters where it's supposed to and Lockheed makes sure it re-enters where it's supposed to. So they currently test these missiles off the coast of California and Vandenberg and aim them to the Pacific, to the Marshall Islands, an area that has been devastated by years of nuclear testing. Luckily, the testing missiles that they're doing now do not have nuclear weapons on board, but they're still leaving a contaminating legacy in the environment and something that we should all be concerned about. Um, Lockheed Martin's annual revenue from nuclear weapons is less than 3% around its of its overall turnover. Again, it's not a big part of their business. So it's something that they can and should drop. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, because now I wanna talk about a company that has some of the biggest contracts related to nuclear weapons out there. It's Northrop Grumman. And they got, they won the contract for the new US ICBM system. And they did this by buying a bunch of other companies. So they bought out the competition. In fact, Boeing sued them because they, got, they bought out the competition. 
but they won the contract anyway. It's a massive $18 billion contract um, to build this new system, excuse me, 13 billion contract over 18 years to build this new system. Not only that, but Northrop also manages the assembly plants where weapons are put together. And two of them in particular, Pantex and Y-12. So not only are they um, building the missiles and, built, you know, and building the new system, but they're also managing and operating the plants where the missiles are built. Um, uh, Northrop Grumman has had some really big problems at a number of these plants over the years. And in fact, just last year, a couple of, of young guys were killed putting together missiles at a Northrop Grumman facility in Utah. Northrop Grumman also keeps promising it'll bring jobs into communities, and yet it has failed to deliver on every single one of those promises. Northrop's not a company that I would trust. Um, however, it does, I want you to know, it makes about, uh, up, makes upward of 25% of its annual revenue from nuclear weapons related work. And Northrop CB, CEO, Phoebe Novikich, um, I apologize for mispronouncing her name. I'm sure I did. Um, she brings home 20 million a year to make sure these contracts keep going. And they spend an unbelievable amount lobbying. We'll have a report coming in a couple of weeks, in a couple of months that details how much they spend lobbying to keep these contracts going. We go to the next slide, please. Finally, because these companies don't do this without reason. I mean, yeah, they're making some profit, but they can't bid on the contract. They can't acquire other subsidiaries to build these, to get these contracts, to, to eke out the competition without help from the financial sector. So PNC is one of those financial institutions that helps these companies. Um, PNC has four and a half billion in financing to nuclear weapons industry. And they're doing that um, because of course, PNC makes a profit on those loans, makes a profit from underwriting those bonds. Um, and in doing so, they provide the capital that these companies need to bid on future contracts. Now, all of these things are part of a bigger picture around money for nuclear weapons. And with ICANN, we do a lot of things uh, around this issue. So if we go to the last slide, please, I just wanna invite everybody to keep this issue in your thoughts and to maybe join us, whether you're an investor, you built, and as if you're an investor and you're voting your proxies, listen to what Jillian's going to tell you. Oh, but make sure you vote, vote there. Um, but if you're looking at ways to get involved in the question of money for nuclear weapons, we have a lot of resources available. Um, and we're calling for a week of action in June because right now governments are spending more than $80 billion a year on nuclear weapons. And that's enough to convert homes to solar power, get clean water and sanitation for more than a billion people. We can do so much more, including cleaning up the legacy of harm from nuclear weapons production, testing, and use that we still have to do to, to redress these, these crimes of the past. Um, I'm gonna leave it there and thank you all very much uh, for this time today. Thank you so much, Susie for that explanation regarding what entities are involved in nuclear weapon development and also for suggesting potential solutions, um, which is very reassuring knowing what, what we're up against. So thank you again, Susie. Our next speaker is Tommy Piemont. Um, Tommy Piemont joined BKC, a Catholic church, I'm sorry, a Catholic church bank based in Paderborn, Germany as head of sustainable investment research in 2016. He's mainly responsible for the further development, operational implementation and monitoring of the bank's ethically sustainable investment strategy. He's also the bank's representative and a founding member of the European engagement network of institutional investors, shareholders for change. Prior to joining BKC, Tommy Piemont was head of the German Sustainability Rating Agency at IMUG in Hanover, now part of Etha Finance Group. The graduate economic, economist complements his experience with many years of work in the financial market, including as a securities specialist at Deutsche Bank. Hi, Tommy. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi to you all, and uh, thank you for having me here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to... Uh, give you a, a little bit of insight what uh, 
Bank für Kirche und Caritas, which is a Catholic Church Bank, uh, is doing about uh, his ethical sustainable investment strategy uh, and in the field of uh, peace. So um, let us start with the first slide. Okay, so probably better understand why we are doing that, uh, what we are doing. So it's uh, good to have an overview uh, who Bank für Kirche und Caritas BKC is. So we are a Catholic church bank, which um, has a statutory object of promoting institutions uh, in the field of the Catholic church, uh, charitable uh, institutions uh, and um, missions and orders um, and so on. So uh, our main object is not maximizing profit, uh, profits like uh, other conventional banks, I would say. Um, the second point which makes us special is that, of course, as a Catholic church bank, we have the mission um, to integrate sustainable in aspects into our investments but also in the products for our uh, companies, uh, sorry, for our clients. And all this thinking is about based on the Christian values um, that we are representing, not only in the products and the investments, but in all our banking activities. Beside of that, we are a conventional uh, cooperative church bank. So what does this mean? So we have the same uh banking um obligations like every type of banks uh acting and and operating here in Germany um we have a balance sheet total of 5.6 billion euros so we are not a small bank but we are not the biggest bank so i would say we are the mid size uh, of the cooperative um banking system here in Germany we have around 150 employees and most of our cooperative shareholders are also our clients. And furthermore, they are all in the Catholic sphere and the caritative uh, sphere. So let us go to the next slide. So coming to the point uh, of, uh, of today's um, theme, um, what has it to do with peacekeeping? So our ethical sustainable investment strategy and of course also credit strategy, is a mirror of our Christian values. So that means that our exclusion criteria uh, is built up to await and, um, and yeah, not to make it possible to do harm to the issue of protecting human life, justice, integrity of creation, and of course, peace. Therefore, we are not investing in companies that have um, revenue uh, more than 5% of weapon productions or weapon selling um, to the sale of firearms to the general public at all, um, also uh, to 0% of revenues, every type of companies that is involved in the production um, of controversial weapons or strategic parts of controversial weapons, and of course also of every type of um, weapons of mass destruction. On the countryside, so um, on the government bond side, you can say, we are not disposed to um, invest into countries that have a nuclear arsenal without full disarmament plan. And of course, at the moment, none of these countries have any disarmament plan. So we are not investing in any country that have um, nuclear weapons uh, at the moment. We are not investing also in uh, governments who spend more than 4% of their GDP on um, defense. Um, and we have introduced three years ago Oh no, four years ago, three or four years ago, I'm not sure anymore. Um, also, the ratification of the conventions of the biological and chemical weapons. Um, so you can see also our exclusionary criteria is always under construction, it's never finished. We are looking into the issues around the world, 
we are thinking about what can we do, what uh, what has to be done to make it even more stronger and even more aligned to our Christian values. So um, next slide, please. Beside the exclusion criteria filter that we implement in our ethical sustainable investment strategy, engagement is a really important pillar of uh, our investment strategy. So what makes it a little bit more special, I would say, is that we are not doing engagement only on the company side, but we are doing engagement also with countries and other investment objects like funds. We are using every type of dialogue and voting strategies where possible. And to make it more effective and more efficient for us, uh, we are using uh, three different implementation channels to do their engagement. So in some cases, we are doing their engagement alone, but as you can imagine, as a mid-sized bank uh, with 150 employees, uh, we have not the resources to do every type of engagement alone. And sometimes it's not even um, really effective to do it alone. So we are using also an external service provider, which is specialized in um, ESG issues that um, covers um, a big part of our own investments in doing engagement. And then we are doing a really actively um, co collaborative engagement together with other institutional investors, primarily with um, an European institutional investor network, uh, which we are also a founding member, which is called Shareholders for Change, uh, which are all value-based investors. So asset owners and asset managers working together and doing engagement. Next slide, please. So it would be good to, to give you some practical examples of uh, engagements that we have done in the field of weapons. Um, saying that what the type of engagement we are doing makes also a little bit a different to other engagement styles is that we are doing the so-called shareholder activism, which is, in our perspective, you are invested into a company or into a government um, or you would like to be invested in, um, and you are doing engagement around sustainability issues. On the other hand, we are doing shallow criticism. Shallow criticism is used by us when we are not invested into uh, a company or investment object, and we wouldn't like to be invested in it, but we think that it's really crucial to do engagement anyway because of the, um, the, the importance of the sustainability issue. And we are doing both. To give you the example on shell activism, we have been invested into government bonds from Namibia when we have introduced our new um, exclusion criteria um, of the ratification or the um, accession to the UN Biological Weapons Convention. And Namibia at that day um, have not been uh, one of the members of the UN Bio Biological Weapons Convention. And we entered into a really fruitful dialogue with uh, government representatives and diplomatic um, representatives of Namibia. And um, yes, yeah, successfully, uh, we have been uh, in the way that Namibia two years ago accedes to the UN Biological Weapons Convention which makes us really proud, but also happy. It's not only uh, the merit of us, but probably we brought it uh, a little bit uh, easier and, and faster uh, to uh, for Namibia to exceed the UN Biological Weapons Convention. On the company side, um, we have done um, engagement with Rheinmetall and ThyssenKrupp, which are both German weapons um, producers, um, big defense companies. Rheinmetall um, have exported um, bombs to Saudi Arabia, which then used them uh, against the civil population in Yemen. And therefore, we have done a lot of engagement uh, with Rheinmetall. We have uh, had a direct speech at the AGM 
And for being able to have a speech at the AGM, we bought one share uh, with our Shareless for Change network to have a voting right and a speech right at the AGM um, to put the um, shareholders' attention on this issue that, from our perspective, is not only an ethical issue, but also a financial issue because it's raise up a, a risk for Rheinmetall if the um, supply chain law, which probably can be connected with the business and human rights um, UN um, convention, um, can cause a lot of uh, legal risks for them. On um, the second example, ThyssenKrupp, we united um, a big investor alliance um, to tackle um, in ThyssenKrupp on their um, uh, submarine uh, production, which um, on their submarines, we had the clue that it could be possible to arm them with nuclear weapons, but also uh, because of their export practice, because they export their, um, their submarines and also other um, naval ships, to uh, Egypt and Turkey, which of course use them also for the human rights abuses in their countries, but also abroad. Um, in both cases, uh, we have to admit uh, that we have not been successful in the way that they stopped the export practice or they stopped their, their production of submarines. But what we have been able to do is um, to um, have a big coverage uh, of the issue in the, um, in the media, um, to raise awareness into the um, conventional investor space, but also to put the attention of the Norwegian Pension Fund um, to the issue of the uh, export practices of defense companies, which now has been one of the new exclusionary criteria for the Norwegian Pension Fund, which of course is one of the biggest in the world. So, and this is um, quite a good success. Next slide, please. So this is the last slide and only to reconfirm all the former speakers that nuclear weapons for us is um, also as an, an investor perspective, is a really big, um, big issue because nuclear weapons um, is a financial risk at uh, in itself, you can say. And therefore, of course, we are also engaging on nuclear weapons. Um, thanks to ICANN and one of the Shellers for Change members, uh, Etika Estier, it has been possible that uh, BKC joins an in, in, in Western coalition um, in 2002 uh, in 2022, um, to sign a statement against nuclear weapons um, with demands um, to the TPNV signatory states. Um, and uh, you can say that the core of it, or probably the core for me, uh, was to make it clear that it would be illogical to ban the production of nuclear weapons without banning the funding that makes the production possible. So, and this is something that uh, we raise always uh, in our engagement dialogues, that the funding uh, of, of weapons and nuclear weapons is really cru crucial to eliminate um, and to brought it to the political table and the legislative uh, discussion. And the statement has been read out uh, at the first conference of the TPNV in uh, 2022 in, in Vienna. So, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tommy. Really detailed and helpful information on investor actions and engagement strategies. Thank you so much for joining us and speaking today. Um, our final speaker, is our very own Jillian Lyon. She is a program director at Investor Advocates for Social Justice, and she leads our campaigns and engagements on climate and dignity. Thanks so much, Tracy. Um, so I, I know we're running short on time, so I will breeze through some of these, um, but really just wanted to give an overview of the shareholder proposals ISJ filed and the company reaction. So Erin, um, if you can go to the first slide there. 
want to highlight that ISJ affiliates filed four shareholder proposals on demilitarization this year with Lockheed and Northrop on lobbying alignment, PNC on human rights policy implementation, and RTX on a human rights impact assessment. And if you want to move to the next slide, I'll talk through really quickly Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman. We heard a bit about them from our other panelists, um, but our proposal is asking for the companies to report on how their lobbying is aligned or misaligned with their human rights commitments. Northrop spent in 2022 11 million and Lockheed 7 million on federal lobbying. And much of these activities are pretty much a mystery to investors, including what legislation they lobbied on and for what outcome. And th these numbers don't even include third party lobbying activities or trade groups. Northrop and Lockheed are two of the largest defense contractors in the world. They sell weapons to dozens of states involved in conflict or that have a track record of human rights abuses. Um, both of these companies have weapons that have been linked to civilian deaths and potential war crimes in areas like Yemen and Palestine. The proposals call out that there is this well-documented kind of revolving door between defense companies and U.S. government bodies that are supposed to be the ones regulating arms sales, which weren't serious concern. Um, and maybe go to the next slide. I'll talk about a related proposal with PNC, which others have mentioned. Um, this is asking the company to report on how it implements its human rights policy. And the bank has been a financer of multiple projects and companies that violate human rights, including pipeline projects that violate indigenous rights. And as Susie mentioned, they lend over $4 billion to nuclear weapons manufacturers. And in this proposal, we really wanted to call out the intersectional nature of human rights abuses in the defense sector and related industry, noting that social and environmental impacts are deeply intertwined and companies need to address that intersection when they do human rights due diligence. And on the next slide, I'll talk about our last proposal, which is with RTX or, or Raytheon, asking for a human rights impact assessment, which is a tool for companies to identify their most salient risks and better mitigate harms. We'll mention again that RTX is another major defense contractor, weapon sales connected to states involved in ongoing conflict, human rights abuses, also a major producer of nuclear weapons and have weak commitment on human rights. I was hoping to move to the last slide and just in these last couple minutes, um, share a bit about the company responses to these shareholder proposals, which I think has been most interested in telling um, related to where they may have gaps or there are concerns from investors. The companies have made have been increasingly aggressive in their response to these proposals and made even misleading comments. So I wanted to talk through a few of those. The first is that companies claim that by complying with U.S. exporting licensing, they are deferring to the U.S. government or U.S. foreign policy to do human rights due diligence on their behalf. And just want to note on that, that we would hope that the company is not doing anything illegal. I don't think we should need a shareholder proposal just to ascertain that. So concerning... Um, it is concerning that the companies have been using this defense that compliance with US law, compliance with these export licensing requirements, um, that's kind of all they need to do. They can wipe their hands. Just to emphasize, the UNGPs are a standalone responsibility separate from the government's response, separate from the government's responsibility. The second is that implementing the UNGPs may put the companies at odds with the US government, which is their largest. Uh, customer. And that's also to note that UNGPs help companies mitigate risk. Companies are exposed to material risk even when they are legally compliant. We know there are many risky business activities that are legal to pursue. And furthermore, the UNGPs are very consistent with U.S. policy. The Biden administration just released the section, second national action plan on responsible business conduct to emphasize this. The third claim on nuclear weapons being not illegal in the U.S., I think the other panelists have covered really well. So I will move to that last point that the they, the companies have claimed that the proponents, the shareholders, um, just simply disagree with U.S. foreign policy. And we don't have an issue with these company practices. We really just have an issue with the U.S. government. And I just want to emphasize that most of the companies have said that doing human rights reports would be, quote, detrimental to shareholder value, end quote. So really just to emphasize that if doing basic human rights due diligence is fundamentally detrimental to the company's bottom line, Evidently, there's an issue with the company's core business model. So that's why we file these shareholder proposals. That's why a large number of investors continue to support them. And with that, I will leave it there and turn it back to Tracy to bring us to the Q&A. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you so much.
Um, yeah, so we have a few questions from the Q and A, and let's see. The first question that I see is, "What do you say to company allegations that human rights due diligence is a waste of resources or harmful to shareholder value?" That's an open question. Any panelists can can take that, or do I have to pick someone? Tommy, so I can take this. Uh, or I can start. <laughs> uh, so I, I, it's totally nonsense from from my perspective because, um, of course, there are legal risks, there are financial risks. Uh, we see a lot of uh, supply chain laws arising around the world, um, and of course, um, none of the companies can say that uh, they can eliminate for one hundred percent the 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 legal uh, risks that is connected. Uh, with with their uh, production and, and, and defense uh, export practices. I agree. I agree, Tommy. It's nonsense, as you stated when you first began. Does anybody else want to respond or should I move on to the next question? I'll go on to what role can responsible investors play if they have already divested from the defense sector? Maybe Susie could answer that one. Sure. Um, well, there's a number of things um, they can that it would be great to see. Um, one is to remind their remind their constituents, remind their um, their stakeholders, those who with whom they engage, that they have di divested from the defense sector and why that these issues are still of concern and that they have taken and maintain a principled position. So stating publicly that you've done this. Um, is as important as doing it, right? <laughs> and so I think that's that's something that we sometimes forget or people don't don't feel like, oh, we don't need to tell anybody. No, tell people. It shows good, it shows a good behavior and people need role models. They need positive examples. They need to see that you're still making a profit and making money for your for for people without being connected to an industry that makes a killing from killing. So I think that's really that's really one of the, the the top thing I'll say is tell others and encourage others. Um, another thing is to go to some of the some of the service providers and ask service providers to make their top line off the shelf products um, like the the primary indices exclude the defense sector or at the very least exclude controversial weapon producers. We should not be seeing controversial weapon producers in the primary in the main indices. It's just, it's just ridiculous. So we should get them out of the list. We should downgrade all of them. And so that's another thing that people can do and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. And I add one, one more thing because uh, this is really important for me because I'm advocating a lot for that. So I think um, investors um, do not have to be invested um, into companies for doing engagement with them. So um, to be honest, we are seldom asked by companies which we are in dialogue with them, uh, which amount we are invested in them. And uh, if you are not invested in, in shares, uh, you do not have uh, even the voting rights. You have the only possibility to get into a dialogue with them. So if you are a bond investor, uh, of course, you have the, the possibility to dialogue with them. And the, the company does not even have an overview of who is the bond investor. So um, also, if you are not invested, you can do that. And we are proof of that, that you can do that. Uh, so, um, and um, I, I would like to motivate every type of investor, take a stand, uh, as Susie said, uh, to make public what you are thinking and what you are doing and probably what you are not doing and why. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy and Susie. Thank you so much for that. Um, it, it is 12 o'clock. We're going to take one or two more questions. If anybody has to jump off, we are sending out the presentation um, in the recording after this, so we totally understand. But I'm going to take two more questions. Um, is there an example of a company providing an analysis of its lobbying alignment with its human rights commitment? Jillian, can you take that question? Sure. Yeah, I think we've seen a few examples. 
Um, definitely with these kinds of reporting, it's always hard to point to best practice, but um, I would definitely call out a uh, disclosure like from Microsoft, who also contracts with the U.S. government, who's also involved in some similar business activities as these defense contractors, who have published, um, I would say, pretty transparent disclosure on how they're lobbying, if it's aligned or misaligned with their human rights commitments, um, specifically calling out sensitive business areas that investors might be concerned about. So there's definitely precedence across different sectors. I would definitely point to Microsoft as an example close to the defense sector where we have seen good examples of, of disclosure. I would just add that uh, with the defense sector themselves, um, we haven't really seen a best practice in, in transparency around this issue, which is partly why we filed um, uh, the lobbying um, shareholder proposal at two companies. Um, and so that's an ongoing, that's a work in progress to try to push the defense sector companies themselves to be more transparent around these activities. Thank you, Courtney and Julianne. Um, and then one more question. Can you explain what dark money groups are and how they work to advance the defense industry's agenda? I can cover that maybe a little bit. It's definitely related to the lobbying side, um, but definitely there are some types of nonprofits, uh, 501c4, that are, are common, kind of this dark money um, group where companies will donate. A lot of times it's even tax deductible as kind of like a charitable fund. And investors have almost no transparency to where this money's being going and what's it, what it's doing. And a lot of these groups use uh, many of those funds to do lobbying without any transparency or accountability to who's funding them. Um, so we've seen this happen a lot with the defense contractors. The concern here is that the companies are channeling a lot of money to these groups where they have no legal obligation to disclose um, their donors and that they are lobbying to weaken and undermine the human rights protections um, so that these companies can kind of push through their contracts as quickly as possible with as few checks and, and balances on that um, and just send them out to clients and, and buyers without really any productive human rights due diligence. So that that is a huge concern with, with dark money and, and the companies we engage. I could just throw one more thing on there. A number of these companies, they themselves don't um, use their corporate funds to contribute to campaigns, for example. But instead, what they do is they encourage their employees um, to contribute to employee funded political action committees and, and other things that help finance um, electoral campaigns. Um, and this is primarily, we see this in the US, so speaking in the US context. Um, and those, you know, those funds then that get turned around and for example, um, Huntington Ingalls Industries, right? That's a, a big, um, quite a big company is connected to a number of facilities that, that produce nuclear weapons. Um, they don't have a, a pack of their own, but they have this, they strongly encourage employees to donate to the, to the employee pack. Um, and they contributed to like 95 U.S. election campaigns in 2023, which wasn't even an election year. Um, so you can imagine that, that this is coming up and we'll see quite a lot more of it. Um, if you're interested in this, uh, Open Secrets has a lot of information about this. And I encourage, encourage people, if you want to get details, um, they are a great resource for this information. Thank you, Susie. I will drop that and that's opensecrets.org. Um, and we'll drop that in the chat in, in just a second. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you, Julianne. Um, okay, so at this time, I think that those are all our questions. I would like to offer an opportunity for any final remarks. Sister Susan, would you like to give some final remarks? I hate to put you on the spot, um, but I think you'd be the best candidate. Uh, not really, but I'm grateful for everything I've, I've heard, um, about the nuclear weapons, um, a lot of information about what's going on with the, uh, the bank in Paderborn. I know somebody who has relatives there. It's wonderful. And, um, also about the, uh, 
other resolutions that uh, you all are doing. So no, thank you for this. Okay. Um, Anyone else want to say any other other, I'm sorry, panelists want to give no. any closing remarks? No. No? Okay. Well, if not, thank you guys for join, joining us. I want to um, pass it over to Courtney to close us out. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, we are really grateful for your participation and your willingness to learn more about this topic. And um, I'll just conclude with saying money talks. What do you want yours to say? <laughs>